So I didn't particularly want to put the word waste in the title because, again, it's not a term that we would use very often. So I've called this maximizing resources in the Irish seafood sector. So just a bit of background. Uh, the whole sector is worth about 815 million euro, uh, employs about 11,000 people. We, have, we deal with approximately 40 plus species. There are a few new fish species which I'll, I'll show you now in just a moment. Uh, about 1,900 vessels, 250 aquaculture operations, so that would stem from, say, uh, salmon, trout production, mussels, oysters, etc. About 190 companies of, of particular size, and there's some other statistics there. Uh, I think these slides will be made available after the, the session. In terms of our uh, European exports, the main markets that we're looking at, we export about 67% in total of our uh, production. France would be the biggest, 23%, UK 15%, Spain, Germany, Italy. So significant amount of product is shipped out. Uh, there's also, of course, a lot of growing markets and emerging markets and expanding markets. Um, if you think about the European versus the rest of the world, we're looking at 2% Russia, Asia, China is obviously a big growth area for Irish produce. Uh, Nigeria, we send a lot of mackerel, herring, pelagic fish species to Nigeria. Uh, and the likes of North America. So it's quite small, but it's, it's on the increase. Huge array of fish species. So all the usual suspects in terms of cod, haddock, whitefish, crab, and some not so common or not so well known fish species, such as the one on the left here, boarfish. Now, boarfish is quite interesting because up until quite recently, it was re relatively underutilized in terms of a fish species. So we have an initiative uh, looking at this particular species in depth. And we also have, for example, Dublin Bay prawns, crab, et cetera, et cetera. Irish produce and products are world known and world renowned. Everything from our smoked salmon to our, our domestic type products. Here's a Kyohan's product here you may have seen. <laughs> skin packed, shelf life about nine days. Uh, crab, crustaceans, again, prawns, etc. Uh, there's an emergence of sort of reformed fish products. A lot of companies getting into this space. Fish pies, chowder. So we're trying to do as much as we can with the raw material uh, as possible. We have some very tough competition. Um, there are numerous studies done on consumer perception of Irish fish and Irish seafood. And for example, the top left there is Pangasius or tilapia, uh, one of these imported farmed fish species. And if you put the two fish, uh, maybe a haddock or a cod beside this, sometimes it can, be, it can break down to price point. People would prefer to buy the cheaper product, unfortunately. Now there are socio-demographic factors there as well. But likewise, if somebody, uh, if, you, if you were looking at, say, the, the prawns here, which I think are venenomy prawns, versus Dublin Bay prawns, which might be three or four times the price, you would probably naturally opt for the cheaper option. We have a lot of competition, of course, on a global scale from the UK. This is the Saucy Fish Company here, just to give an example. And seafood and fish, of course, is always in competition with other protein types. So beef, chicken, pork, etc. So... I suppose, in, in light of the competition out there, though, we have some very strong sale points. A lot of our companies are affiliated and al allied with the Origin Green program that Borbia have just discussed. We also have, for example, quality approved organic Irish salmon. Uh, a high proportion of our salmon is organic, uh, whereas if you look at the Norwegian salmon, the majority of that is non-organic. Um, of course, we have a lot of artisan knowledge of pr and producers in the country, and we have the likes of the Great Taste Award uh, stamped on a lot of our products. This is another, another initiative that some uh, vessels and cooperatives are signed up to, Responsible Irish Fish. Uh, fish, of course, is considered healthy and good for you, etc. And it's also con considered clean and green. So a lot of unique selling points there. So in terms of BIM, we like to talk about maximum utilization of the catch. Um, we, we, we shy away from the, the use of the word uh, waste in favor of byproduct and byproduct utilization. So in terms of why we're looking at the whole inverted commas uh, waste area is because by tackling waste, we think it can confer competitive advantage on the companies. Um, it becomes a point of difference uh, in terms of your product, if it's stitched into your brand values, et cetera. You know, we, we're aware of waste, we're doing as much as we can to reduce and to use up the waste and the byproduct. Uh, we also tackle waste at, at the production level in terms of say energy, water, uh, production packaging usage, we try to reduce that as well. There are numerous government initiatives out there also guiding uh, our, our activities in this particular space. 
So in terms of an example or a few examples of priority waste projects that we're, we're involved in at the moment, we have maximization of production efficiencies. So again, trying to look at overheads in water. A water, of course, is a major factor in any food production system. And also looking at new product innovation and technologies. And as part of the new Seafood Development Centre in Cork, uh, where I spend a lot of time, we would look at new technologies and new innovations and try to extend the shelf life. And I'll give you a few examples now of what we're talking about there. So this is an example. My colleagues are involved in BIM's uh, Green Seafood Business Programme. And basically, it's, it's allied to the, the Origin Green Programme. And we're looking to deliver resource efficiency, cost savings, environmental impact, and significantly reduce the running costs of uh, food operations. This is basically what it does. Um, you have an initial review. They look at every bit of usage, energy usage, water usage, et cetera, in your, in your production system. They look at bill analysis. They look at electricity monitoring over time, et cetera, et cetera. And they provide green uh, awareness training to staff just so that they're conscious of uh, potential savings in particular areas. And as I said, it is affiliated with the Origin Green program, the Borbia program. We have some case studies on the BIM website if you have time to look. Um, this one here, I think there was a saving of 30% in total on water usage. And again, water usage in the seafood sector is phenomenal. It's huge. So that represents uh, significant savings, financial savings at the end of the day. Another initiative in terms of fish, fish is obviously quite perishable. And the first opportunity for waste or byproduct generation is at the first point of sale. So when the vessel lands to a, a port, um, situations, now this is, luckily is not an Irish fish or an Irish fish box, it's probably a name up there, but so, uh, obviously what's wrong with this picture? Ineffective icing. The likes of weather conditions, we had a storm there uh, in the last 48 hours. The vessels may have been out or may not have been able to get out. So whether a fish spends one day on ice on the board, or whether on, on board on, on the vessel, or whether it spends eight days at sea can obviously affect the quality of the fish as well. There's a lot of seasonal variation in fish as well. When a fish is sexually mature or when it's spawning, etc., the fillet quality can be slightly different. That can affect the nutritional profile of the fillet. It can affect how long it lasts in the fridge. So we would work with vessel owners and skippers, etc., and we would uh, discuss the optimal onboard handling and processing for different fish species. We would talk to them about what to do if they encounter a problem, how to effectively ice, uh, how to overcome bad handling, etc., etc., and also cross-contamination. If the fish at the port is of non-optimal quality, there are initiatives underway whereby we're feeding some of it through the pet food chain. So we're looking at development of treats and dog foods, etc. We're doing a little bit of work on greyhounds in particular. That's a very particular type of research we're, we're working on at the moment in terms of performance. It can be used for the likes of uh, gelatin extraction. And more and more, uh, we're getting into the whole area of nutraceutical and bioactive development and extraction. There has been talk of potentially a plant opening in Killy Beggs to develop the likes of the, the bioactive, the protein hydrolysates, etc. Um, we're also actively involved in trying to quantify and understand the amount of waste that's being generated. And I'm, I believe early next year we're actually going to recruit a graduate, and he or she is going to go out and try and quantify at different stages of production how much waste is generated, with a view to then uh, putting a plan in place. If you think about something like salmon or cod, your fillet yield will hopefully be 50%, but could be as low as 35%. Now, it's very much species dependent. And again, other factors can affect, again, whether the fish is full of egg, whether it's nearly spawning, will affect the fillet yield, et cetera, et cetera. So if we have a fillet yield of 50% or 35%, then you potentially you have a byproduct there of 50% to 65%. So we're very interested in what we can do with that because it is both a valuable and an expensive byproduct. It's not a waste. The fisherman, sorry, the, the seafood processor had to pay for that material. There's, a, there's an inbuilt transport and storage cost. If we think about something like crab, the guys, after they extract the meat, et cetera, and are left with the shell, they actually have to pay 135 euro per ton to get rid of it for incineration. So the onus is on us as an agency, BIM, to try and work with the industry, try and find new uses for this raw material. Because remember, the whole fish coming in the door and off the vessel is considered wild, Irish, potentially organic, if it's something like salmon, uh, responsible Irish fish, RIF, and origin green. So we have a raw material here that is still, still fits all of these criteria here. So it should be marketed 
and it should be used because it is valuable, it is nutritional, and it should be saleable. So part of the initiative of the new Seafood Development Centre, which is part of BIM, is to look at developing new market-led concepts. So concepts that are tried and tested and take, take direction from the market in terms of what's selling out there at, at the moment. So part of my daily job is to trial technologies at STC, Seafood Development Centre, and also in factory. We also go around Europe maybe and look at new, new technologies with a view to bringing them back and trialling them in factory as well. There's a focus on maximum utilisation of the raw material. So we're trying to prevent anything being wasted at this stage. And we link with industry, we link with universities, research both domestic and international, we link with ingredient suppliers and equipment suppliers, and we're constantly kicking this ball around in terms of, it's a waste at the moment, or it's a byproduct, what would you do with it? Can you bring us solutions? And we put on industry workshops to discuss these. This is an example of a project that we're working on at the moment. Uh, what you have on the far left here is a batter meat separator. Now this technology is quite common in the chicken industry. So after they take the chicken fillet and the wing and the leg and all the recoverable meat off, they then pass the carcass through this. And what it does is it, it basically uh, pushes the carcass against the drum and you have a lot of the soft material uh, comes out through. Now, there is a confusion here about recovered meat and mints. In our opinion, this is a particular mince, the process that we're putting it through. So what you're left with is the middle picture there, a high value mince. Again, this is potentially origin green. It's potentially sustainable. It's potentially highly nutritious, et cetera, et cetera. So what we're doing is initial trials. We've literally taken the mince 100% and we've started forming it into 100% fish cakes there, just to see. Now, obviously you can see it's a little bit redder. This was haddock. Uh, it's a little bit redder in color than the snow white flesh that you would normally see of a haddock. But when it's cooked up, when it's put through a cooking process, it comes up nice, nice and white. So there's one potential product and we're doing feasibility studies to assess different options. This is a line that we have in Clonakilty, so it's a mini forming and breading line. So again, we're taking the flesh off different fish species, we're forming it, we're mixing it, back mixing it with other fish species, with binders, etc. And we're developing both, we call them naked fish cakes, but non-breaded and breaded formats. And we're also looking at the yield, the, the potential yield of uh, mints from the frames. In this particular scenario here, from a ton of fish waste, now what we did was we took the carcass after the fillets were taken off, we removed the head, and we put everything else through this machine. From a ton of backbones, you could call it, we got 500 kilos of this mince, which again is flavor, flavorsome. Uh, it represents material that the guys weren't using and didn't have access to before, and it is valuable. We're also taking the mince and looking at how many, how many different types of products can we look at. So for example, we might, we might try in, in uh, early January next year, Surimi. We're in discussion with Surimi manufacturers to see are you interested in buying the mints? We'll freeze it down for you. We're also incorporating incorporate it into pâtés, etc. And also in some of the, uh, in, in Nigeria in particular, and in China, there are these dried sort of uh, uh, analogs here whereby they're put into a soup base and they're used to, to reconstitute a soup. So our job is to develop working concepts. A lot of the industry are busy trying to get the products onto the market and out the door meet, meet uh, buyer requirements. We have a lot of flexibility in BIM to look at, look at these concepts on behalf of industry. So if you think about the mints there, it's not optimal color. So one of the things I'm doing next week is we're actually looking at, there's a, a clean type of bleaching system you can use. It's not bleach, but it just, uh, it just cleans up the color slightly. We don't put bleach into seafood, just sort of, <laughs> sort of my camera. <laughs> uh, so we're looking, at, we're looking at, say, in terms of this mince, how long will it last? Obviously, when you mince up something, it's more open to uh, uh, going off a lot more quick, quickly. So we're looking at oxidation, we're looking at binders. Some of the mints can be quite nearly like a pate type texture. So we're actually putting fiber back into it and we're forming texture. So it's more familiar to, uh, to the consumer in terms of taste and texture. We're looking at shelf life, pH, all of the, the scientific and the food science sort of aspects. We're also looking at coating systems because if a mince is very soft, you want to reintroduce maybe bite and texture back into it. So that can be done through batter and crumb, etc. We're also looking at throughput, and we're looking at, we're developing hopefully turnkey solutions for industry. We're also looking at, this is the mints just basically frozen down into a seven and a half kilo block. So again, that's a product, product in itself. You could sell that onto uh, uh, other processors. You can also bandsaw it up and make it into fish fingers and you name it. This middle picture here is actually the boarfish mince, the small fish that I mentioned. 
And there's a lot of interest in uh, China at the moment for this particular product because they form it into sort of uh, dim sum type meatballs and stuff like this. This is the boar fish. So we're, we're also uh, developing, this boar fish is literally half the size of my hand. It's not feasible to fillet it. You can't put it whole through the, the, the meat separating machine that we, we just mentioned there because the eye has actually a dark color in it and the mince comes out very, very black. So we're developing a new machine which takes the head off and the gut out and you're, you pass the remainder through and you get it out as a mince like this. The top right is literally fresh off the press. It's work we did last week. So what we did was we took 50% of the recovered mince and we're dealing with different species. We're mixing possibly with 10%, 20% chunks. So you might put nice chunks of salmon through there. And we're also mixing through potato. And again, we're trying to do a lot of this uh, troubleshooting and brainstorming for industry. Seafood, as I said, is quite perishable. Um, and down the chain or up the chain in terms of uh, Tesco and supermarkets, etc., the limiting factor for a fresh fillet will be the shelf life. So that fish, when it's packed today, in six or seven days' time at end of shelf life, or just before end of shelf life, should have similar quality attributes as we have here in terms of oxidation, taste texture. So what we're doing is we're trying to maintain and trying to buy extra time in terms of shelf life specifically and particularly for raw fish. Um, some recent projects, we're looking at extending the shelf life of different products. For example, I just used the Kyohan's product as an example here, just for a visual, but a skin pack product versus a gas flush product. The skin pack shelf life is roughly eight to nine days. And again, if that vessel had to spend two extra days at sea, you're kind of eaten into that shelf life. Whereas gas flush or modified atmosphere pack might be five to seven days. So I don't know how many companies have said to us, if you can get me an extra 24 hours, that is gold dust especially if you're exporting to mainland Europe, uh, but also to iron out some of the constraints in terms of availability. If you can get an extra 24, 48, 72 hours, that's the kind of research that we think is, is hugely beneficial. So what we're doing at the moment is we're actually using injection brining. Again, we've stolen this from the chicken industry, but we're injecting clean label ingredients. We're just trialing this. Obviously, you don't want to detract from the fish fillet in terms of sensory and flavor. You don't want, you don't want any uh, nasty E numbers in there. And to date, we've got 24 hours extra shelf life. So in theory, your skin pack is now 10 days as opposed to nine days, and your, your map pack is possibly eight days. So again, that's gonna help in terms of the markability of the product. It's gonna be able to sit on the shelf a lot, lot longer, if it was Tesco, for example. Um, and it's also gonna sit in your fridge a lot longer. So hopefully reducing, extending the amount of time you have to sell it and to use it, and reducing the waste down the line. Um, so ultimately, we're trying to develop turnkey solutions, which we can bring as solutions to industry, because industry uh, are hungry for new ideas. So in terms of these turnkey solutions, we're looking at clean, green brand values and credentials. So again, trying to keep E numbers to a minimum. E numbers is not as bad as they make out, if you ask me. Uh, transport trials, we're looking at the seal integrity. We're making sure the product actually stands up en route to Tesco or, or en route back home. We're looking at shelf life extension, optimized packaging pro protocols, maximum utilization of the fish. So we're developing uh, concepts, for example, on the bone for Spanish market as well at the moment. So we're trying to get as much of the raw material out there as we can. And we're also looking at multi-component product interactions. The seafood sector understand fish inside out at this stage. But what happens if I put a raw fish in there with a cook sauce or some potato or some mash? So we're trying to demystify a lot of that for the companies and again, just hand them a working document as to how the whole thing works. And then, of course, we're trying to apply this me methodological approach to all the species. So in the case of crab here, you know, we're looking at all, all the usual suspects, such as crab claws, crab meat, uh, the legs, which are uh, prized in, in uh, China. We're looking at whole crab, and again, we're looking for shelf life extension of whole crab. And then we're taking the, the shell, and we're looking for chitin. We're looking at chitin extraction. Uh, we're also talking to companies about fish stock development because that's another element of the waste that you can reduce or the byproduct. Now, ultimately, there will be a byproduct or a waste, I'm not using that word, um, of shell. But again, I see a lot of stands upstairs in terms of composting. So there are obvious avenues there potentially to put it into compost. Um, ultimately, a major part of our role and our activity over the last five years has been upskilling industry with this new knowledge that we're generating. And a very important way that we're doing that is we have a graduate placement program. Now, it's currently being run in conjunction with UCC, University College Cork, and LYIT, because there's two major fishing hubs 
in the, the northwest and the southwest. And ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, a graduate will come in and work with us for uh, six months, and then for a further three months, uh, they go into industry. And we hope that the industry will take the graduate on and keep them on indefinitely, forever. <laughs> but uh, what, what, what we're doing is we're trying to impart this sort of innovative mindset in terms of we're exposing them to as much as we can over those six months. Um, these guys will, in future, have to probably do more with less in terms of the wild fish that are out there. I mean, the, the ups and downs in terms of supply. They need to be technology savvy. They need to have a waste not culture. They need to bring new solutions to old problems. Um, they have to look at the entire production chain and make sure it's profitable. And they have to have a focus on sustainability and brand identity. And they have to understand why they have to glean as much value uh, out of the product and how that feeds into the brand. The trend of supplying an aging and a growing population, uh, that, that's very important for us as well. So we're looking at different types of formats that might appeal to a younger audi audience, an older audience, a more a richer audience in terms of emerging markets, etc. And the most important one up there is understanding the market requirements because all the product development that we do has to be market-led. There's no point in developing 10 concepts in the hope that one will work. We have to take the market data. We have to take, for example, the board B, a Kantar data, the Mintel data, look at su successful concepts, and then reverse engineer the USPs, the unique selling points, into the products that we're producing. So in terms of main areas to focus in the future from a BIM perspective, as I said, we are recruiting this graduate in 2015, and hopefully he or she will, will, will help us to understand what is going on in the sector, what's been used, what's been underused, what are byproducts. We'd like to strive towards using 100% of the raw material. Now, whether that's feasible, but that's where we would like to go. We need to constantly look at new technologies to expand the shelf life and the distribution of this, because if a raw fish is only lasting seven days, that is going to cause a problem. So if we can buy an extra 24 or an extra seven days on top of that, uh, that'll be beneficial. We're developing viable concepts for new and expanding markets. So again, what does the, the Chinese market require? You know, maybe there's an opportunity to, to ship. Maybe they prefer fish on the bone, for example. Growing nutraceutical and pet food opportunities. So again, we're looking to produce bioactives and stuff for cardiovascular health and brain health, et cetera. Um, and positioning Irish seafood as a healthy choice, that's hugely important because seafood has this healthy, uh, um, what's the word? <laughs> Help me. Reputation. 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 <laughs> uh, and then building upon, of course, the Irish clean and green credentials for the Irish seafood industry. So that's where we would like to be, hopefully, next year, if not in the next 10 years. So that's my contact details, and I think these slides will be made available. Uh, I'm not sure if we have Wi-Fi access, but I'll try this thing here. Um, there are a few uh, commercials on the BIM site, which will tell you a little bit more about us. This may or may not work, but this is just an introduction to the Seafood Development Center that's roughly five years old at this stage. It's not going to work.